Good evening and welcome. Before we get started, we would first like to send our thoughts and cares to those who have were affected by the bridge collapse in Baltimore this morning. We would like to let you know that you are in our prayers and we're thinking about you and wish you health and safety for the rest of the day and the uh, days ahead. So hello everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's FAA Women's History Month event. Meet the women of Strike Fighter Squadron 213. The, uh, the Fighting Black Lions, sponsored by professional women's controllers and the Technical Women's Organization. I am Bridget Turner, the National President of the Technical Women's Organization, TWO, and Airway Transportation, Transportation Systems Specialist, ATSS, and Program Support Specialist. I will be moderating the conversation today with these phenomenal women from the aerospace industry. First, I am honored to introduce Ms. Jennifer Dempster. She is the president of the Professional Women's Controller, Inc., PWC, and acting general manager of the Joint Air Traffic Operations Command, or JATOC. In her role as acting general manager of the Joint Air Traffic Operations Command, or JATOC, Ms. Dempster integrates service units at all levels of the air traffic organization and ensures a unified ATO response in an effort to significant incidents and other major events or natural disasters that adversely impact the national airspace system known as the NAS or national security. The JATOC addresses constraints, risk, risk and threats to the NASH and communicates this information to ATO leadership and appropriate stakeholders. Everyone, help us welcome Ms. Jennifer Dempster. Thank you, Bridget, I appreciate it. As Bridget said, my name is Jen Dempster and I am the general manager of the JTOC and president of PWC. And I am extremely honored to be here tonight to kick off this final FAA national event. I had the privilege of hosting a panel very similar to this a few years ago with some amazing women who broke glass then. And we have another panel tonight that's gonna to do the same thing. As many of you know, we've all been told to dream big. And for the women you will hear from tonight, they did exactly that. Women in aviation are the few and the proud, but we also need to be able to lean in and remember where we came from. A lot of us were little girls who stared up at the sky, dream big, sort of the beyond. But let me throw some stats out at you. 7.7, .7, less than six, and 16.75. Now let me break that down for you. 7.7 .7 are the number of female pilots. That's a percentage. 7.7% .7 is the number of female military pilots. Less than 6% are female airline pilots. And that 16.75, well, you probably already know, that's the percentage of air traffic controllers that are female in the agency. Dismal to say the least, but there's always room for improvement. And I believe that we can get there in the next few years. The women on this evening's panel are not only dreaming big, but paving the way for the next generations to come. Perseverance, dedication, probably a little attitude, which I like to call passion, have provided them the opportunity to achieve a spot at the table and in our skies. As we begin to close out the Women's History Month, I ask and encourage everyone listening to these women tonight to please think of your daughters, your nieces, your cousins, your neighbors' kids. Inspire them to dream big like these women. Encourage them to go for what they may think is not achievable because guess what? It is achievable. And as we are seeing throughout this entire month of amazing speakers, anything is achievable. I'm gonna leave you with one last thing. A mile of runway will take you anywhere. The stars should be your destination. Spark the light of aviation in just one girl and watch them soar. I'm so honored to be here tonight with these women. And Bridget, I'm gonna hand it over to you because I don't wanna take any more time because I'd like to see what you got going on. 
Thank you, Jen, Jen, for all of those encouraging words. I, I stand by you and also encourage all, everyone to inspire and be an inspiration to our young women and our young men out there who are in, mm -hmm. interested in the aviation industry. We can only shoot for beyond the stars and we yep. can continue to be examples as our wonderful speakers we have had this month and those who we have on today. So Jennifer, thank you for uh, helping us kick off and close out this program for today. Thanks, Bridget. You're welcome. As we mentioned, each month, each year, and during the month of March, we celebrate our nation's Women's History Month to recognize the achievements of women, past and present, in the United States. As women play a vital role in the history of our country and our aerospace industry, this year's theme is women who advocate for equity, diversity, and inclusion. This theme is so important because it allows us to highlight and spotlight those who have made achievements in the aviation industry to show support and how we work together to advance the mission of a safe, the safest national airspace in the world. So we appreciate all the contributions and look forward to those that are coming before us. And we stand on the shoulders of those who came be, uh, before us as well. So thank you for all your contributions and your acknowledgement to the aviation industry and the steps and challenges and barriers you have made broken for us to be here today. So as we begin, if you have any questions, we ask that you please place them in the Q&A box. We will try to answer as many questions as time allows us to do so. So thank you once again for joining us and I'm ready to get started. So I am honored to introduce and welcome our distinguished panelists from the Women of Strike Fighter Squadron 213, the Fighting Black Lions, they are three extraordinary Navy fighter pilots and one weapons system officer who have shattered stereotypes and blazed trails in the skies. As I introduce each of you, please turn on your camera and mic and give us a wave to let us know that you're there. First up, we have Lieutenant Commander LCDR Amber Bolsama. Hi. Hi. Lieutenant Rebecca F. Pole Ryan. Lieutenant Anthony Miss Dennett King. Hi. And Lieutenant Chandler F. N. P. Hensley. Hello. And they'll tell you more about what their names mean. So everyone. Help me welcome our guest panelists tonight from the Women of Strike Fighter Squadron 213, the Fighting Black Lions, and our uh, weapon system officers. Welcome tonight, and we are so honored to have you as our panelists today. So let's get started. We're going to dive right into the questions that we have for you. So as I go around, I would like to each one of you share us a little, share a little bit about yourselves and what inspired you to fall in love with aerospace and decide to become a Navy fighter fighter and or a weapon system specialist. Um, LCDR, we're going to start with you. Hi. Uh, so growing up, I had an older brother that was involved in some general aviation, took me for a ride as a kid. I kind of got hooked on that. And then, uh, actually started college in Tennessee, had the opportunity to get an incentive ride uh, down at NTSU, got re-hooked again, and uh, ended up changing my major, going out to Washington State uh, and studying aviation management out there. Worked through all of the um, qualifications I could get there, you know, private pilot, commercial, uh, instructor, double IMEI, all of the all the fun stuff there. And towards the end of my time, um, met one of my fellow students, aviation students out there that was joining the Navy, had some conversations with him and kind of got, you know, hooked on that. What's, what's the coolest thing I could do? I could go land on a boat. So went up, saw a recruiter, uh, joined the Navy and just about a month after college, went to OCS, went through training, uh, actually started flying Hawkeyes for the first four, five years of my Navy career, and then transitioned over to JETS 
and have been just having a blast ever since. Awesome. And I'm going to come back to you. We have another question, but I'm going to uh, give go around and have, ask everyone to tell us what inspired them. Lieutenant Rebecca Ryan, can you let us uh, know what inspired you as well? You're on mute. Thank you. Not very Zoom savvy. Um, I grew up around uh, agricultural aviation in Texas. My dad was a crop duster pilot for 30 years. So I grew up essentially waiting for him in the hangar to go do jobs and come back. I was obsessed with flying from probably before I could walk. And he took me to the USS Lexington in Corpus Christi, a uh, decommissioned aircraft carrier museum. Um, so I knew I wanted to fly and then he took me there and I knew I wanted to fly for the Navy since I was uh, about seven. Um, didn't know how I was going to do it, but I was determined it was going to happen somehow. So I uh, managed to pick up an ROTC scholarship and do the Navy ROTC program at the University of Notre Dame uh, and uh, got very fortunate to be picked up for aviation. And really, it's just been a blast ever since. So. Thank you for that. I, I know there's someone out there that's listening and can relate to some of the stories that you just shared with us about how you got started and inspired. Uh, so thank you as well. Lieutenant Chandler, can you also answer the same question? Share a bit about yourself and what inspired you to fall in love with aerospace. Sure. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Uh, my name is Chandler Pensley. I'm originally from Fairbanks, Alaska. So definitely a lot, a lot of small planes up there. But really what sort of my path is, I was able to attend the Naval Academy and there were exposed to a lot of different of the service community options, submarines, ships, Marine Corps, all that. But I just really liked the pilots and the pilots I had the chance to interact with. I remember speaking to one woman who would have been about four or five years ahead of me and she didn't even know me, friend of a friend. And she spent like, two hours on the phone telling me, you know, what it was like at the time she had just finished primary, which is the first stage of training. And so I was like, well, I don't really know much about it, but I like these people. And these are the people who I want to be with. So I got to say that uh, still continuing now. The people we meet, they are very, how they can change our lives. So it's important to just continue to get out there and get involved. Thank you for sharing that. Ms. Antoinette Dennett. Can you let us know what it is about being a weapon system officer or what they call it, WISO? Hi, yes, um, I'm Antonia King. My call sign is Mrs. Dennett and I am the WISO of the group, a weapon systems officer. So I actually sit in the back seat of the F-18. Um, my father was a Navy pilot. He flew the A-3. And so he introduced me to Naval aviation from a very young age. Um, he spoke highly about the career and always tried to encourage me for it, but I didn't think that I was capable. So I actually went to Penn State and studied business and received my bachelor's. And then shortly thereafter, started working for a bank. But after about a year of sitting at a desk, I realized that I needed a little more in my life and my desire to fly increased. So I figured I would regret if I didn't at least try. Uh, so I ended up going to Oscar Candidate School and I received my commissioning in 2018. And then once I started flight school, I knew right away that I had taken the correct path because uh, flying in fighter jets is probably the most thrilling experience anybody can have. And I count myself so lucky that I get to do this every single day. Awesome. Each, as you can hear, everyone's story has their own path. And yet here they are today making a difference in aerospace. As I introduce each one of you, um, what came to mind and some of the questions that I had your call signs. A lot of people don't understand what they mean. So I would like to keep it back at Miss Antonia. If you can let us know what your call, what well, explain what call signs are in reference to your name. And if you have one, what does it mean? Sure. So uh, in each squadron, everybody is given a call sign. It usually takes about six to eight months to get one. And it's usually based around something funny you did or something related to your name. Um, they're all very unique and it's kind of a fun tradition that the, the Navy and the military in general has. Um, so uh, my call sign is Mrs. Dennett. Uh, it's based off of a movie, uh, but 
I don't want to go in too much detail with it, but uh, I love it and it's super fun to have one. It makes you feel really part of the culture. Thank you. And I would like to ask if anyone else would like to share a story about their call sign. Re Rebecca, I, I, come off. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> I saw you come off mute. <laughs> I'll save you. I can, mine, mine's not too crazy. Um, but when I was flying uh, Hawkeyes uh, a few years ago, um, we were getting ready to launch off the boat. And in the Hawkeyes, should you have any crazy emergencies where you're not going to be able to land, you can bail out, which you basically are connected to your seat. You, you pull disconnect handle, you jump out and you have to pull your parachute. And I was pre-flighting that prior to, to launching and accidentally managed to uh, sort of pull the rip cord in the in the plane uh, and deploy the the parachute inside. So that was a uh, big, you know, kind of embarrassing moment of oh, I messed that up. They had to change out the seat and and do all kinds of things to get us get us launched again. So I got the call sign of Bo, which is short for bailout, uh, just in relation to that story. Thank you for sharing. And we uh, know everyone gets into organizations or jobs. And as you mentioned, your call names and how you can get our, what we call a nickname. So appreciate you sharing those inspirational stories or experiences that allow us to know what it means and how we can become relatable to when we see your name. So thank you for sharing that. Is uh, Anyone else would like to share anything about what their call names or the experience of a call name? Rebecca? She said no. <laughs> That's fine. And do, do everyone get one? You, I mentioned you mentioned about a time frame in reference to getting a call name. Uh, sure, if I may. Um, I'm the newest one to the squadron, so I've only been here about two months rounding up. And so right now, like, I don't have a call sign. Um, I'm just the new guy. Um, and I'll, it'll be that way for probably the next half year or so. Thank you. So appreciate once again, appreciate you sharing it. I think it's very important that we, uh, as you shared your inspiration on how you got started, and we see the different names that people can understand where that comes from and the different experiences that they might have in relating to getting a nickname for themselves as well, a call name. So thank you for sharing. So your stories are very inspiration and inspiring to us. We want to continue on with some more questions. Uh, we want to find out what are some of your memorable experiences or missions that you have had as fire, as fly, uh, flight pilots and um, your as whistles. So, Miss uh, Pensley, can you please tell us uh, one of your memorable experiences, please? You're on mute. We can't hear you. There we go. Try that. Um, I was going to say, like, you know, I am by far the most junior one um, of the air crew here, but coming to this squadron and flying with like my very first flight, I flew with our executive officer and I flew with CAG, who's the head of our air wing. And so seeing going, being able to go out even just on a training flight and seeing the incredibly high level of expertise and knowing where I am, but also having that coaching and instruction and being able to work together as a section, as multiple aircraft, um, is just really, you see where you are, you see where you want to be, and you're with the people who are bringing you and instructing you to get you to that level of skill and proficiency that, you know, you hope to be at within a couple years and even more as you work, as you kind of develop um, this craft. Thank you. Lieutenant Rebecca, Ryan, can you share one of your member one experiences as well with us? Oh, gosh. Um, there's a uh... There's a, there's a lot of moments that you look around and you, it's a little bit surreal what you're doing, but uh, one, one of the ones that really sticks out is landing on the ship for the first time, uh, especially landing on the ship at night for the first time. So that's uh, one of those moments where you kind of start looking at what you did to, to get to that point. And it's uh, cool to see how far, you know, uh, how much progress, you know, you, you make. And it's uh, especially awesome to look around at all of your friends who've been there uh, throughout flight training to see where you started and 
you know, uh, how far you've come at that point. So. I bet that was a breathtaking this land on the ships. I'm going to say this. I see it in the movies, but to actually do it, I know it can be, I'm, I'm sure it was thrilling and just breathtaking as well. Is that how you felt also? Definitely. Thank you. Thank you. LCDR or Summer, Ms. Sum, can you please uh, share one of your memorable experience with us as well? Yeah. Um, I mean, I've got, it's hard to break out one memorable experience, but kind of similar to uh, Becca's, you know, first landing on the boat. I think for me, the first catapult shot was kind of the, the most, I don't know, strange moment of, of my life. And it's more fun than any, uh, you know, ride you can take or, or anything. And it's more terrifying, uh, especially at night, like she said, uh, but, but that, and many of the, the night landings we've had where it's, dark, there's no moon, and you get on deck and you, your knees are shaking, you're terrified. Like, how did, how did that just happen? I don't remember the last, you know, 30 seconds and how I got here. Um, but I think those are some of the fun experiences that, that I've had. I'm going to come back to, I have a, I'm coming back to what a statement you made, because when you, when you think about the night, you know, we, we can see good in a day, but is there anything special you have to use when you um, dive and when you say countable at night to see where you're going and their, uh, the, your surroundings? Uh, no. So for, for those, like we do have night vision goggles that we wear once we are airborne, but you can't wear those for catapults or for landing. Uh, so you're kind of just going in blind, if you will, you know, trying to get your vision to adjust as quickly as you can. And hopefully, hopefully you're still airborne and everything's working out. Oh, wow. Thank you. Thank you. And of course, uh, Lieutenant King, can you share some of your most memorable experiences on missions as a weapon systems officer? Yes. So uh, one of my like greatest experiences was last year we were on deployment and I received the opportunity to travel to Germany where I got to participate in this NATO exercise called Air Defender. And it was a really unique experience. We got to fly with our NATO allies as well as the United States Air Force and these huge large force exercises. Um, it was really cool. They gave us tours of their aircrafts. We got to talk with them, collaborate and kind of see how they work versus how we work. Um, and then just flying alongside them. It was ex exhilarating flying over Europe, talking to air traffic controllers that are, have very thick accents. It was it was super cool. And it was also just super motivational because the our foreign militaries had a lot of women as well. And we could share our own experiences and kind of collaborate on how we make improvements. Um, that was just extremely special. And it was a real honor that I got to participate in that. Well, thank you for sharing. Uh, you know, it, it really just dawned on me as you were sharing your story that you are not just here in the United States, you're traveling abroad. So there's many uh, entities in different languages and cultures, cultures that you have to encounter and adjust to. So uh, thank you for sharing those experiences. And as you shared your story and experiences with us, um, how you were inspired by someone and you saw um, them operating at that higher level, as um, was mentioned. So we appreciate you allowing us in uh, those stories and experiences of your life. So I, I'm sure as you did all of these um, experiences in your job that you faced some type of challenges. So can you let us know how did you navigate or overcome some of the challenges that uh, being a woman in a traditionally male dominated field, how did you navigate through that? Uh, Lieutenant Rebecca Ryan, can we start with you please? Uh, sure. Um, uh, I think that where we are now uh, as a military, the culture is generally either neutral or positive when it comes to the inclusivity of women in fields like this. Uh, at least when I've flown with my friends um, or classmates and for the most part instructors as well, uh, it's generally no difference really. We all do the same job. I don't think we think of it any differently. Uh, for the interesting situations that you might find yourself in uh, as a, as a woman that maybe you guys don't have to think about. I think it has been, it has been nice, um, that there are more women coming into this field because we kind of stick together, back each other up, you know, have a, a, have a little bit of a network there that we can relate to each other. So. 
Thank you. It's good to know to know that you have um, established a network and it's there for you for support. So that's something good because we want to we want to make sure that we let our young women know and though anyone who's listening that no matter what field you go in, as she just to share, that you can find a support system. And if it's not one, create one. Lieutenant uh, Antonia King, can you uh, share with us if you had in, overcome any challenges or how you navigated through them? Yeah, so I, I agree with a lot of what uh, Becca said. And I see that similar is that the biggest challenge really is a lot of times being the only woman in the workplace. You know, we are really fortunate because our squadron has a lot of women. And so we already have a tight knit community. However, there are other squadrons that still only have one, maybe two women. And so the way we pretty much navigate that is recognizing that while our squadron may only have one, we're still all part of one team and come to each other for advice and for support and lean on each other when, whenever that's needed. Um, a woman is just as capable as performing at a high level in this career. And as more women join, we can continue to pr prove that. I know personally, I felt pressure that I need to overcompensate uh, or outperform my male counterparts as a way to prove my value to the squadron. But I know that this pressure is mostly internal uh, since my squadron works extremely hard to make sure that everyone feels equally worthy of being here as long as they're performing to the best of their abilities. And I think that has just been a big change in the Navy and in aviation in general. And it's just exciting to see how that changes. And as more women come in, we just continue to build each other up. Awesome, thank you. And uh, we definitely wanna make sure that we ask Lieutenant Chandler if you, uh, and LCDR Sama, uh, if you can share with us this, uh, some of the same um, challenges, uh, what did you might face and how did you navigate them? Uh, here, I'll go, I'll go first unless you wanna go. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, you know, it agreed. With all of that, we've come a long way as a community, and I do feel like our, our squadron is great, like full of professionals, and everyone is held to the same standard. Uh, but you do have to, you know, work hard and and kind of be the best to maintain the, those those standards. And um, really, like one of the biggest keys is confidence, which I, I feel like you know can be hard for a lot of people. It's definitely hard for me, but you have to be confident and show that you are worthy, believe that you are worthy, if you expect anyone else to believe that or see that uh, as well. But yeah, like they said, we are we are surrounded by a lot of people who have our best interests in mind and want to train us to that standard. And they've they've done so and they've done a great job of it. Thank you. And I know you said you only been in for a couple of years. Uh, Lieutenant Chandler, but uh, have you, what have you experienced so far with that? Well, I definitely second um, everything that, that you guys said. I think for me, the biggest thing is always like the nuts and bolts, like the gear, like finding, um, you know, working with a supply officer and ordering women's flight suits and, you know, just like we wear harnesses and G suits. And I think the, there's been a lot of change the past couple of years. And I know the Navy is really working towards like, I mean, as our gear evolves, um, I did uh, some measurements about six months ago um, for our helmet and working at the spine and cause the gear is rather heavy. Uh, so I think that, you know, for me, sometimes like it's not a cultural notice, but sometimes you're like, oh, wow, this really wasn't designed for me, but it's trending very much in the other direction as they work, you know, to kind of modernize the gear that the gear that we're wearing. So the helmets are lighter. That's better for everyone. You know, things like things like that. Thank you for sharing. Um, uh uh, Bo, Simon, you had made a couple of statements and I, it made me think about, you said some of the key things in reference to being in this field, being in where you're working at and having confidence. Can you share and give some um, insight on what other tips you would give for um, women coming into this industry? Um, yeah, the, the confidence I think really is key and just, you know, believing in yourself and believing that, you know, we are all, we're all here for the same thing. 
and um, just actually, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know how to say it differently, but but you know, truly b- believing that we can do this, and we're you know, lowering these these pushing through these barriers, doing all these things right, and we're all one team. Okay, thank you. And I would like to uh, ask the, any of uh, the other three when you think about. Um, t- Challenges. I know they all don't have to be negative. And we talked about what you can do to be have confidence and key. Is there one thing that you say to yourself or um, a quote that you can share with us that helps you get through um, your day? If one of you would like to share. Go ahead, Rebecca. <laughs> um, it's going to sound really silly, but um, someone told me this once in a very early on flight in primary when we were flying formation to wiggle your toes. And, uh, I remember someone said that once in a yoga class, you know, uh, at the very end of class to kind of bring you back, uh, to, you know, refocus. And, uh, I still tell myself that all the time, like wiggle your toes that just brings just enough relaxation. So like when you're too tense, you know, you're not going to be performing at your best and, uh, some amount of stress is healthy and good. Cause that means you care. But when you wiggle your toes, you can just kind of like loosen up just a little bit and generally perform better. Thank you for sharing. Uh, thank you for sharing those uh, key confidence and tips that um, that you do and practice to help you get through. And I want to let everyone know if you have questions, please remember you can put them in the Q&A and we'll be uh, more than willing to answer as many as we can before the end of the program. So those were some excellent insights. And I'll have to say your resilience and your dedication and, you know, are truly, truly to be commended. So we um, appreciate you sharing that with us. I want to shift gears a little um, to discuss the future of women in aviation. Um, What uh, advancements or changes do you hope to see that um, support greater inclusion and diversity in aerospace? Lieutenant Antonia King, I would like to ask if you can uh, respond to that. Yes, so in the short time that I've been serving in the Navy, I've already seen a cultural shift in welcoming women into into the community. Um, So really in order to improve inclusion is just to continue maintaining this current course of action. Uh, Currently, the majority of senior leadership is made up of men. And as more women join, this needs to change for the future. We need to have more female leaders in these senior leadership roles that are there to inspire the future generation of aviators. Um, There are challenges that are really specific to women, specifically like family planning, but, and this can sometimes feel like a barrier to career advancement, but I can see that that is already shifting. Um, And it really has to do with the current leadership. If the current leadership is able to provide support to women who work hard and wanna be able to achieve all of their dreams, Uh, then I think we will see more women staying in, staying longer, taking on those roles. Um, It's not going to be a quick solution. And it's really just about having an open dialogue and women who just continue to fight for what they want. And the women that I work for with are the most passionate people I've ever met. And I know they will continue to fight. And so I think we'll see a positive trend in the long run. Thank you for sharing that information. And uh, Uh, As you already mentioned, you have a support group and you guys are working together. So continue to move forward in in that fight. I would like to ask uh, Lieutenant Chandler the same question. You know, what advancement or changes do you hope to see um, for the greater inclusion and diversity in aerospace? Well, uh, not to repeat myself, but I love gear and I love talking about it. And I really think that as especially in I mean, all the communities, like all the communities have their own individualized, you know, whether it's their harnesses, their G suits, their helmets, like we all have specialized gear. And I think as that becomes more personalized for a wide variety of body shapes and heights and weights, I think it will honestly just make a huge difference because you're more comfortable in the jet than you're able to perform. And I think at the end of the day, like all of this, you know, it's like we work together, we train together so we can perform and having our, you know, survival gear and our daily wear gear have that also be be working towards us. 
um, working towards that goal, I think will make, will make it feel more accessible because you'll just be like, wow, this can be me too, because I have what I need in order to succeed at the job. Yes. And, and I'm sure we all like fashionable. So if, if, when we look good, we feel good and we can work better um, in our jobs. So thank you for sharing. I, I'm a big gear fan as well when it comes to doing my job, because I feel if I have the right equipment, I'm safe, I'm doing the job and I perform, it does make you feel uh, a higher level of performance. So thank you for sharing that with us. And I and I want to hear um, from the other two, Lieutenant Summer and Lieutenant Rebecca, the same question, because you all are in this field. So we would love to hear your perspective on it as well. Uh, yeah, I mean, they kind of kind of hit on, you know, what I, I would consider some of the main points as well of, you know, getting, getting things that fit us uh, gear wise and, you know, the family planning. And I think, you know, events like this are great in also just, you know, letting people know that there are, there are women out there you can talk to, you can network, you can create these, these, you know, systems and be able to ask the questions that are, you know, more, more specific to us. Like, how do you deal with these certain circumstances? You know, how did you get past this barrier or that, or, you know, how do you structure your daily life and, and how do you have that home life while also working and mm -hmm. trying to do all the, the family planning and stuff. So I think it's, it's great to have uh, things like this and be able to, you know, talk to other people with, with experience and, you know, similar things that you can kind of work off of. Thank you for sharing. Lieutenant Re Rebecca? Would you like to share it uh, as well? Oh, gosh, I don't know that I have a whole lot to add. I feel like they covered it very eloquently. Um, the The only last point, I guess, is uh, gear related as well. But um, I know that some people are out there know I'm going to talk about this, but tactical dehydration is uh, still obviously a problem in our community. And as long as that has to happen, people aren't performing at their best. Uh, and we don't currently have very affordable means of dealing with that issue. So I think that that would be a huge step moving forward. Oh, wow. Well, thank you for sharing. And every bit of information you share is relevant and it gives us an insight to know about your experience and what you feel, um, or what you experience to let us know that these are things that can help us in our future for aerospace. And we hope that we'll be able to support that. And some of the things that you that was mentioned about the gear, family planning and balancing uh, with your careers, how do you balance your life? How what are some of the one or two things that you do to balance when it's come to your work and the um, outside entities or families? Um, Antonia, uh, can you please share with us? Sure. So it's not easy. Um, I currently, um, I'm not married. I do not have kids, but I have two dogs. And so they are my babies and it, it's tough, especially with all of the traveling, the long days. How do you manage that? I thankfully have, I have a lot of friends who help out people who will watch my dogs when I'm gone, but it is something having a family is important to me. And you know, I'm, I'm really grateful that the conversations I've had with my senior leadership about wanting to have a family in the future have been extremely positive. Uh, they support it and are say, you know, if you want to continue this career, you want to continue to grow and have a family as well, we'll find a way. I mean, there always is a way. And, you know, I, that's all I need is just a little bit of hope. And I think, I think that it just, is all the motivation I need to continue in this. I would like for one more person to respond if you'd like to share, how do you balance um, your life and your family planning? Uh, well, kind of a similar, similar experience there of, of really it is the uh, leadership. And for us, we have a great squadron, a great front office uh, that is, very cognizant of people and their, you know, their, their family life and their personal needs and being able to have those open conversations, go to them and say, you know, Hey, I need, you know, this, this time here to be able to, to, you know, spend time with my family and whatnot. Uh, they have 
made great efforts. I know like personally I've I've experienced uh some times when I've I've needed just to take a little time here and spend time with my family, rebuild those things. And they have been very helpful in giving those opportunities. And I think that's just a, a huge thing uh, that has really, really helped out with that. But that's great to know that um, your leadership do support and um, in reference to family lifestyle and balance. I know um, in the beginning, we talked about um, the squadron and everything. I wanted to, before we go into questions from our audience, um, Lieutenant Rebecca, can you share a little bit more about what you do on your job? Um, oh, uh, so kind of what we do for work, you mean? Or uh, so we do uh, several different mission sets, uh, air to air, air to surface. Um, and uh, part of our job right now is really getting through our qualification process. So. When you show up to your first fleet squadron, uh, which we are all currently at our first fleet squadron, you're working really hard to get qualified in the next level, essentially. So uh, you show up and you're working on being a wingman. Uh, then you're working towards being a section lead. So leading one other aircraft doing these mission sets. And then after you become qualified to be a section lead, you'll then work towards becoming a division lead. So leading three other aircraft in these mission sets. So a lot of our day is uh, it's not as exciting as you might think. It's a lot of studying what we call mission planning. There's a lot of sitting in front of a computer. So, you know, it's a uh, it's not all, you know, the flying, uh, but you do really enjoy the flying as well. Uh, and the most important part, I would say, is debriefing. That way you can learn from the limited flight time you do get uh, and just take all the lessons that you learned from that flight to move forward and do better the next time. Thank you for sharing. Just wanted to add a little more insight on what uh, work is being done. And um, Lieutenant Antonia, we know that you are a weapon specialist. Can you share a little bit more about what you do at your job as well? Absolutely. So like I said, I sit in the back seat, so I don't actually fly the jet, but I'm there to kind of do a lot of different things to assist the pilot, um, whether that is setting up navigation, doing communications, and then uh, the biggest thing is setting up the different weapons uh, we have a lot of different types of weapons and they all have very specific things that to be set up correctly, depending on what target you're going for, depending on what type of mission you're doing. And so I can save us time uh, in order to use those weapons by setting that up while the pilot can focus on getting us set up uh, into the best position to employ. And so we work together as a crew, um, we call it Tactical Crew Coordination TCC. And by doing that, we come, become stronger and more lethal. And it's, it's super great. Um, a, lot of the re, I, a lot of people I know uh, end up becoming Wizzos because like me, they don't have uh, the good uh, stick and throttle skills or uh, maybe vision problems, but it's cool that the Navy has this opportunity that you can still fly even if you aren't the best with your hands like me or uh, maybe don't have the uh, perfect vision that you need to fly. So it's an awesome opportunity. Thank you. That actually, uh, thank you for sharing that, that last bit because that actually leads us into some of the questions that our um, audience is um, asking. They would like to know with, how can they convince their parents and or what skill sets that they will need to look for to be um, in, in any one of your positions. Can you share with us what tips you would give to someone who's interested in how they persuade the parents? I can uh, answer a little bit on this. Um, so I went to school and got a business degree. I, even though my dad had always told me, you should join the Navy, you should fly. I, I didn't think I could do it. So I, I went to school, studied business, thought that was my path. Um, and then I, completely took the 180 and joined. The Navy has incredible training. They will teach you everything you need to know. You don't have to come in with prior experience. They will, from the ground up, build you up and give you all the tools to success. And I mean, we're very lucky. Our jet is extremely safe. Um, we are constantly practicing our emergencies. We are ready. And 
it's honestly kind of exciting when you do have something happen, you see how well you handle it because you've been so well prepared. Um, and so I just, I always feel very safe when I'm in the jet. We have an amazing maintenance team that prepares them for us. And it's an, it's honestly an incredible career. It's both fun, but also I would say very safe. Thank you. Anyone else would like to share um, their perspective on it as well? We can take one more. I think just having the opportunity to, again, like I really view flying as a craft and it's something that we train and develop through, again, the debriefs that F. Paul mentioned, through the time in, the mentorship. And then as soon as you get a level of competency, you're the one doing that mentoring and teaching. And so to have that opportunity, I mean, this opportunity to serve in such a specialized field if that's what you want, then that's, you know, for you to do. And you make your safety by being the best at your job and by knowing your system and by working with your crew and working with your lead. And so I think that it, to some degree, it's what, if you choose to pursue this, then you are making that professional culture of safety, of competency for yourself and those that you're flying with. Thank you for sharing that. That actually um, answered one of our questions because people are really interested in knowing, you know, what what did you have to do to join the aviation and um, any other encouraging tips and you just gave it, just, you know, go out there, do it, stay engaged. And when you get engaged, connect with those who are in there. Uh, so we appreciate that. And you mentioned um, the educational aspects of it. Do you have to have a degree to become a Navy fire, uh, pilot? or can you get be one without one, a degree? So we are all um, Naval officers. And so in order to do that, unless in for this particular field, uh, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, because I know the Army has different routes and that's a different world. But for us, we do require bachelors. There are the Navy, I mean, the Navy is so large and there are so many paths, different paths to commissioning. Um, but for our particular pipeline, um, we do require a bachelors. Okay, thank you for sharing. Um, is there any other educational or recommend, uh, educational tips you would recommend? And, or if you took on internships or attended conferences that inspired you? Lieutenant Rebecca, is, is that something you can share with us? Oh, um, uh, so in college, I did study um, applied in computational mathematics and statistics. It's a mouthful. Um, I hated math when I was young. My dad told me I had to be good at math to be a pilot. So then I went and majored in math, go figure. Um, but in, in college, I did do an internship with the Air Force Research Laboratory in Dayton, Ohio. It was one of the best experiences of my life. Very challenging, very interesting work. I did it for two summers. Um, I wouldn't say that opened up uh, pathways, uh, because I already was in Navy ROTC. So I kind of already had my path chosen there, but, uh, I just seeing the possibilities in the field of aerospace is incredible. Um, you can apply, uh, your skills in so many different ways. So, uh, I don't know. I think that was quite rewarding and obviously air shows are uh, very motivating as well. I'm a huge air show enthusiast as well. Thank you for sharing. Lieut uh, Lieutenant Sommer, um, are you aware of any uh, clubs that our youth can participate in or have you participated in any of those as you became um, in, in your field? Um. There were, I, I know there were some, back when I was doing general aviation, there were a lot of clubs. There was, a, I remember in particular, there was one, I, I don't remember if it was a full club or just a, a specific event, but there was a specifically women's race across the country, essentially. And you, you, you know, bring your own plane or, or find, you know, a plane. And it was kind of just a, a fun, cool thing that you could get involved in and, and do. and you know, build those networks and uh, meet people and, you know, with a, a fun end to it as well. Um, I know there's like 
the women in aviation group. And unfortunately, like I haven't had a lot of uh, time to get as involved in these, uh, just being, you know, here kind of in my, in my Navy world. Uh, but there are a lot of options out there for uh, joining groups or clubs that can really help with that, that networking and kind of career path options. Thank you for sharing. We, as I mentioned, we we just want to make sure we share that information, find out your experience, because we have uh, a lot of wealth here, and we want to make sure we allow you to share that. So as you begin your journey and you live life, um, one of the things that we always encourage people is to have mentors and coaches. Um, did any of you have a mentor or coach in your life that inspired you or guide you currently or in the past? If you can share that with us. Antonia? I wouldn't say that I had a specific mentor or guide. Um, the biggest motivation for me joining was my dad. Uh, he loved his naval career. He loved flying. He continued flying until he retired, uh, which was very recently. And he's still obsessed with it. And so... Uh, he encouraged me my entire life, you know, go to school, work hard, you can do anything that you want to do. And, you know, even when I was doubting myself, he was there telling me that I could do this. And it was the reason that I felt the confidence to go attempt to get a commission, attempt to uh, fly. And, you know, initially I didn't think that I would go for jets and he was like, why not? You can do it. Mm -hmm. And I'm so glad that I have him in my life and that, um, and I have that support because I don't know where I'd be if I didn't. Thank you for sharing. And uh, that actually, when you say, and we talk about people inspiring you to become and to get into these uh, aviation, the aerospace uh, careers. So that's wonderful to hear that. So on on the on the other side, as I would say, what do you want to do when you get out of the Navy, Lieutenant Commander Samba? Can you answer that? <laughs> Are you ready to get out? <laughs> oh, I think I have a few more years before I get out, but that is a question that I ask myself frequently. You know, it kind of feels like you're you're back in school. What do I want to do when I grow up? Because uh, this this can't last forever. And really, you know. I, I want to keep flying, whether that's airlines or flying for, you know, FedEx or, or big company like that, or maybe going, um, you know, smaller, smaller aircraft, who knows, maybe I'll just go fly puddle jumpers on an island somewhere. Uh, but the, the nice part is like having these experiences under my belt when I get out and, uh, having the the training that we've gotten here, that opens up a world of opportunities for us uh, once we get out, because we'll have all the all the flight time behind us, and um, there will just be, you know, the the world is pretty uh, pretty open as far as once we get out, what we can do. So I I definitely will keep flying. Thank you. And Lieutenant uh, Rebecca, I wanted to ask you a question in reference to. What is who is your support circle? Oh gosh. Um, well, my family has been incredibly supportive. Uh, my mom always encouraged me to pursue my dreams, so I uh, never gave up on it. The the idea, and I I think that would be the biggest piece of advice I'd have to anyone wanting to do this is uh, it sure seems like an uncommon thing to be able to do. There aren't that many people who have the opportunity to do this, which makes it really cool. But if you want it, you can do it. You know, you just have to work really hard and keep believing in yourself and keep going, essentially. Thank you for sharing. And we're going to stay right there with you. I have another question because we're about to get ready to wrap up. We are respectful of everyone's time. Um, what book or article or music, what do you like to read to inspire you or do or listen to? Oh, my goodness. Um, that's uh, I might need a second on that one. I have a lot of favorite books. So. <laughs> So we, okay, we'll come back to you. We're okay. ready to share. Well, could, um, what, would anyone else like to answer that question? A book, music, or what inspire you uh, that you like to do? 
I see the looks on your faces. <laughs> Favorite music, song? And Tania, you got some for us? Uh, maybe not favorites, but um, when we're on the boat, so when we're on deployment, like books and music are pretty much a main source of entertainment. And so uh, in my stateroom, we actually had a bookshelf filled with books that we had all brought and we kind of created a little library and a book that we all fell in love with on the boat was called The Nightingale. And it was about uh, two women during the war. And it was like a really encouraging uh, story about like female perseverance. Uh, and I think that a lot of us really relate to those historical fiction books where you see these women who achieve amazing, incredible things despite the circumstances that they're in. Uh, and that was, it was a fun experience being able to share that um, and all read the same things. So I think that, I don't know if those are my favorites, but as far as uh, motivational and something that we all share. Thank you. So I wanna thank you all for sharing your perspective. And as I mentioned, as we near the conclusion of our discussion, I would like to know if you all can give us one quick piece of advice that would inspire young women to become a pilot, a fighter pilot, pilot or weapon system officer. Lieutenant Commander Summer, if you can give us a quick tip and takeaway. Uh, really, I think the, the biggest thing is just believe in yourself. You can, you know, it may seem like Things are unachievable, but they're not. They're not. And I feel like, you know, we probably all feel like we're proof of that, uh, of all the things that you going into it don't know about or don't, you know, the, the unknown is the scary part, right? Uh, so really just keep your head down, work as hard as you can. 110% is what you got to give at all times. And you got to be confident. You got to be humble. You got to be able to take criticism because that's how we learn uh, from all of our mistakes. And you got to take that and be able to just keep moving and um, believe that you can. Thank you for sharing. Um, so we are going to close and wrap up. If we, if one of you all would like to share one more quick tip, we can do that. And then I will close this out for today. Ms. Chandler, since you're new, would you give us one quick tip? Sure, I'd love to. I just want to emphasize like all, you know, all of us here, like we all come from different backgrounds and different paths and different exposure to aviation, and we're all here. And so I think if you're like, this is your goal, it really doesn't matter where you're starting from. You like you will end up here in aviation or in the field of your choosing, regardless of where you're starting from. And if you, if you're like, sweet, I'm going to work out, I'm going to take care of myself. I'm going to study no matter again, where you choose to end up, you'll be pleased with how you ended up there. So once again, we would like to thank each of you for joining us today and sharing your story. We know that you was an inspiration to all. Thank you. Thank you. So as we close out, I would like to share and thank you, um, give a thank you to Jennifer Dempster, our acting general manager of the JO, uh, JATOC and the professional women's controllers president for kicking us off today. I will also want to express my thank to each of our panelists for their time, dedication and service, not just for today, but for every day. These are just a few of the women who are part of our history, who are in part empowering women in aerospace, and we appreciate your leadership. Their desire to serve their country makes them role models for all women. And thank you for joining us, especially the young girls and women in the audience. I am also inspired and look forward to being uh, more inspired and hearing the stories. So as we wrap up, I will be remiss if I not mention that the FAA is hiring. Check out our usajobs.gov or faa.gov slash jobs for all current FAA jobs openings for aviation and aerospace provided a career for every career that you think about. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us at outreach at faa.gov. 
and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. So on behalf of the Technical Women's Organization and the uh, Professional Women Controllers, we want to thank you for our program and wish you a happy evening. Thank you.